Oh, come on. Yeah, there we go. Cool. And <coughs> we're live, it seems. Awesome. Great. Okay. Let's just wait for some. Yeah, there we go. We got some people watching. <laughs> hey, Matai. Med. 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 Do you want me to do the intro, Victor, or you want to do it? I don't know. Um, yeah, sure. You, you can introduce me, I guess. Okay. You know, you forgot to put the stream overlay on, though. That's the one thing you forgot. Oh, yeah. I'll do that. Um, sorry. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And copy that over to my desktop. Yeah, bear with me, I don't stream very much. And I guess I just add and do an image, browse for it. You may have to restart the stream. There we go. Let's see here. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Let's Is it showing up on your end? Yeah, I'm just gonna, gonna check on Twitch. It's a little okay. bit of delay. Yeah, about 30 seconds, roughly. 30 seconds? Oh, we're gonna, oh, there we go, it showed up. Okay. All right, awesome. Hey guys, so the stream is now started. We're doing a Mega Scans to Unreal Engine 4 workshop. I am Jonathan Holmes. I am the Quixel Suite product manager slash community manager. Victor Oman, who is, or unless I mispronounce your name, I apologize. It's He's fine. our art lead. And Owen O'Bron, which I believe I got that one correct. He's also one of our artists who does phenomenal work with scanning and putting together scans and a lot of the fun stuff. So today we're going to try to basically do a live rundown of how one of Victor's Unreal Engine projects has been put together, essentially. And uh, I think you guys are going to like this one. It's a real special treat in the way he's kind of worked Megascan Studio into producing some just crazy shapes and, and patterns and you, you got to see this. It's gonna be it's gonna be mind blowing when, when it's done. Um, for the moment, though, I am currently sick, so I'm gonna try to talk as little as possible because I kind of sound like Barry White, and I don't like that at all. So um, I'll be handling handling rather chat moderating today. So um, I'll let you guys go ahead and get started. And if I got anything cool to say, I'll pop in occasionally and say something. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm Victor, and um, the scene you see in front of me or in front of you is uh, in Unreal Engine 4 and it's made entirely, well, with an exception for the bomb, uh, entirely in Megascans Studio uh, along with some uh, Megascans 3D assets. Um, so yeah, I was thinking I'd mainly be showing off like my approach to composing materials in uh, Megascans Studio, um, how I work with the program, how what I like how I see the materials and what I use them for, etc. And I'll also uh, show uh, how I set them up in Unreal. Um, I got a really messy material, so I'm probably gonna have to untangle some node noodles, but it's um, hopefully it's, it's gonna make sense. Uh, and yeah, if you have any, any questions, feel free to shoot them off and I'll um, try and answer them as soon as possible. And uh, Owen, you're uh, here as well. You have also have a lot of experience in Megascan Studio and Unreal. So, yeah. Yeah, happy, happy to pitch in whenever. Yeah. Um, do you want to say anything, Owen, before I, I get started? Uh, I think just uh, as you go along, I'll, I'll jump in if there's anything I see that, that I... Cool. Um, so I'll just jump right okay. over to Studio. Um, so, yeah, this is one of the materials that I use in the scene. Oh, I, I can actually make a quick fly through of the scene. Um, so this is pretty much created like a movie set. Um, so it works from a couple of angles. Um, but if I turn the camera around too much, it's not very pretty. Um, but that's not its purpose. So um, it's using three different materials. It's using the muddy, like wet mud. With the drag marks, um, as you see here, and it's also using a dusty material, which is up here. Uh, it's a bit, bit more dry. Uh, it's also painted out here and there, uh, trying to locate it. 
And there's also a material for the slopes, which is shown here in the shade. Um, and depending on how much time we have, I'm gonna sh um, hopefully show all the materials and how I set them up. And I'm also gonna create some materials. Um, and if you have any any requests for materials, I can uh, try and um, com compose some. Um, just let me know in the in the chat. Um, but yeah. Don't worry. I'm oh, sorry. I said, don't worry. I'll let you know. Cool. Uh, so yeah, this um, there's yeah I, I've done some some adjustments to the roughness and stuff in the in the engine. Like this is sort of turned out to be more uh, muddy than I intended. Um, but it's it's the same materials. I promise. Um, I just added some roughness bias to it. So actually. Do you think it should I should I break this material down or should I maybe recreate it? What do you think is best, Owen? I'd say maybe re recreating will be the best because then we can make sure there's no steps missing, or whatever. It's sure. usually easier to reconstruct that way. Yeah. So I'm just gonna make this uh, stream. Uh, what's the name? Is it is it lava or is it like when it's when it's actually solid? Um, Magma. Yeah, I guess hardened lava. Yeah, black lava. Yeah, stream lava. And I'll hit create. So, uh, we don't have much lava scanned. So, what I usually what I usually do when I'm when creating stuff like this is I use rocks as a base. Uh, so, I'm gonna use. Let's see here. Actually, look for stone. So this is the browser, um, which contains all the different mat uh, materials I've downloaded from the Megascans uh, website. And for those of you who haven't um, seen it, it's over here. And here in the library. So you can just search for whatever you want. And once you download it, it's gonna uh, pop up in your uh, browser here. And yeah, if you subscribe to Megascans, you also get access to the Megascans Studio, which I'm using here. So let's just see if I can find a good base material to work from. I think this might work. And um, when selecting materials for stuff they're not supposed to be used for, what I look for is the shapes and not much, uh, like the large shapes uh, usually and not the albedo and the color information and stuff like that. And this looks kind of lumpy and um, um, there's some nice large soft details in it. And the first thing I'm gonna do is almost entirely reduce, remove the saturation, and I'm gonna darken it. And I have to apologize beforehand if it turns out like crap here because I have the sun straight in my eyes. Um, there we go. And I'll add some height. So here you have some controls for um, a noise or like height noise. So you have amplitude, frequency, octaves, lacunarity, I think it's pronounced, persistence, clamp, and clamp influence. And the ones I use most are the octaves, frequency, and amplitude here. So what the amplitude does is, yeah, as it sounds, it increases like the intensity of the height noise. So I usually set it somewhere around between one and two and lower the frequency for the base of the material. So something like this, maybe. I can preview the tiling of it by pressing T. Maybe reduce it a little bit more, something like this. And boost it up to 1.6. There we go. And it's not really looking like lava. I mean, it's not gonna look, look like lava until at the very end, but we can make it look a bit more like lava because if we look at some references, I really hope that's the actual word for it. No, that's... What is the word for it? Like the mold, the dried lava? It's like a crust, isn't it? Yeah, like... Yeah. Like, I yeah. Oh, oh, by the way, while I have your attention, somebody has noticed that you have additional icons. That's super secret, though. We can't talk about that. Yeah, we can't talk about that, no. That's <laughs> internal stuff. You will see it soon, though. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so this stuff here. So as you can see, it's not very, it's not very detailed. It's kind of smooth. Oh, here is a good picture. It's kind of smooth. Got some like 
wiggly, like layered kind of look. Uh, so I'm not gonna be able to recreate this perfectly uh, without some shader magic in Unreal. But this is the sort of sort of the uh, look I'm going for, like the soft, smooth uh, kind of stuff. So to do that, I will change, reduce the high frequency. So as you can see, it's already like it's removing all those fine. I'm gonna zoom in real ugly close here. So you can see here, all the high frequency details get removed. So if I set this to around maybe around here, we got a pretty good starting point, I think. I'm also gonna increase the glossiness. And you can do that um, by using this slider here. So I think this is a pretty, pretty good level. You can preview the different maps by uh, going through the number keys here. So one is PBR, two albedo, three cavity, gloss, roughness, normal, etc. It's can be really handy when uh, when trying to uh, color match uh, different layers, which I will do now. So next I'll select a, another type of rock. Um, which is a bit, this, this one is darker out of the box, so it's gonna look pretty cool, I think, on top. And it's also got got this nice detail which we saw in the references. I mean, not 100% um, accurate, but it's got some nice similarities. Yeah, it, it's all really, when you're doing this stuff, it's about kind of matching material properties that you notice in the reference. Yeah, exactly. There's a bit of echo here on my end, I'm not sure if there is for you. Hey, Wichter. Yep. You have a bit of an echo coming from Owen. Oh, I do. Uh, I'll lower the volume. Actually, I could try and set up my uh, headphones real quick. No, I can't. Sorry. I'll just lower the volume. Eesh. Sorry. There we go. Cool. Yeah, and that's, that's fixed it, I think. So I'll, as I said before, I'll go in here to the uh, albedo preview and I'll click the swatch here and I'll try and match. So if I, you, you can see where the materials blend here. So I'll just try and match that as closely as possible. And I'll make this a little bit darker, I think. Like that. And I'll also try and match the glossiness. And you can do the same thing here. Just go into the gloss uh, preview and adjust the slider. So I want this to be a little bit more glossy. Just a little bit more. Um, yeah, gloss and roughness are the same thing, it's just inverted, uh, pretty much. So, um, the gloss map, if you export it as roughness, it's just, yeah, it's gonna work. So don't worry about uh, about it being called gloss if you use roughness in your engine. There we go. And here I'm also gonna adjust the height, because I want this to be a bit more lumpy. Um, and I'll play around with octaves. I, I find usually two is pretty good. And I'll lower the frequency a little bit. Something like that. And reduce the amplitude as well. That octave slider is something else, man. Yeah. I mean Yeah, it's really good. I mean it completely turns into an, to another material if you just play around with this. It's so cool. It's also worth mentioning maybe that it's really easy to go too high and too kind of steep with these uh, yeah. when you're tweaking. But it's really important to stay fairly subtle because if you do have a really steep uh, height noise amplitude, you'll start noticing in the normal lap, you get this really wavy repetitive pattern and it'll just, it won't really, it's really good to help break up uh, the shapes, but be careful with uh, how, how far you go with it. Yeah. So yeah, the, the height um, uh, influences the normal map as well. It's worth mentioning. There we go. Yeah, and here's like the, here's my favorite part actually about the studio. I'm just gonna turn off the tiling for now, and that's the threshold. It's like you're you can adjust how stuff how how this stuff blend. It's almost like it's sinking into each other. Um, so what I'm adjusting here is, if you've forgotten, is this part here, like the ones with the like uh, this nice pattern here. So if I drag the threshold slider, it's just gonna come out of the other material. And you can also adjust the radius, which is pretty much like the fall off or like how harsh or tight the actual blend is. So if I take it all the way down, it's pretty much like they intersect. I can zoom in here, you can see 
how they intersect. And if I increase the radius, it's just way more subtle and softer. So I actually want a pretty high radius for this blend. Something like this, because I want I like both materials, but I want them yeah, sort of 50% each. And here as well, I'll reduce the high frequency. So now we're getting this nice soft look on both. And it sort of looked like a pretty good base, I think. I might actually make them even darker. But right now, as I said, the sun is shining straight into my eyes, so it's kind of hard to tell the brightness of what's on the monitor. But I think this looks pretty cool, as a base at least. And looks fine to me. <laughs> yeah, looks great. <laughs> awesome. And it's tiling pretty well. It's um, like the the low. I found that the like having a low frequency on the height uh, height noise is very good for breaking off the repetition uh, when tiling. So if if I would increase the frequency, you can see. Yeah. Yeah. You instantly can tell, and it's important to also make sure there's no very unique patterns. In this case, it, it almost is. Uh, it's not very easy to see where it repeats, but in some scans you can see some very specific rocks or twigs or you know very bright colors sticking out of the scan that can instantly show yeah. its tiling. But uh, you try to be as subtle as you can with these shapes, and you can get a really natural tile that isn't visible. Uh, like the tiling isn't too repetitive in the engine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So now that I'm done with these, I will go ahead and add a soil or a mud or something, and. I actually can't remember which um, soils I used for the original material, but I'm pretty sure I can recreate something uh, similar. Uh, so same thing here. Like now, now I want to add sort of like it's gonna be like crackulated, whatever it's called, like cracked. Um, like it's it's dried up and sort of separated. So um, having like a soil, like maybe th something like this, wavy with some cracks in it. Uh, like something really chunky <clears throat> with large, nice, defined uh, cracks. I think it's going to work really well. Uh, yeah, something up here maybe. I think that's going to look pretty cool. So, as you can see here, the color is completely off. But if you just go into the albedo, it's super easy to color match. Um, something like that. And it's already looking really cool. It's getting nice and chunky. And I'm going to add some amplitude to this as well. And you can see some nice cracks showing up here as well. And what you can do is you can also play with the repetitions of materials. You can make one, one layer tile less than the other. I mean, it's not entirely physically correct, but you can make some pretty, pretty cool results with it. So I'm going to adjust the threshold. And you can also change the... like how to mask if you want to mask from above or from below so notice if i if i do this i get some nice sharp definitions here like the cracks here which i really like and play around with the radius something like that yeah and i want this to be a bit glossier than the rest let's see how this how this looks a bit, bit less. There we go. And reduce the frequency. There we go. Look at that. That's getting nice and nice and chunky. And I mean, there are so many sliders. Uh, I sometimes like to uh, play with the preserved details. I'm not sure how well it's going to show up in this. And it's kind of hard for me to see. Actually, uh, Owen, do you know exactly what this does? Because I'm like I'm using it, but I'm not exactly sure what it's doing, <laughs> to be honest. I'm not too sure either. I think uh, it may preserve some of the detail that's being lost in the radius blend through the different materials, but I, you'd have yeah. to, I'd have to check it. But uh, it does seem to preserve a little bit of sharpness in the normals when you're sliding it up. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, it actually tends to preserve whatever's underneath it as much as it can within the confines of the other sliders. Gotcha. Right. You can always this... ask Alvar for a detailed explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that looks looks like a face. 
<laughs> and yeah, I think I think this is a pretty good amount of high frequency there. And I don't have enough cracks, so I'm gonna go ahead and add one more with some more cracks in. I think this one looks pretty cool. Let's check it out. So a lot of a lot of work that I put into the stuff like this is just adding adding material, seeing if it works, going back and like ch trying different different materials and see how they how they work together. Um, yeah, look at that. There we go. That's super nice. Mm. So yeah, you you get some really different results when playing with the repetitions. Um, and you can also. Like you can play around with the offset and the um, uh, rotation of the um, of the layers. Uh, I think it's in is it forty five degree or is it ninety degree rotations? Yeah, ninety degrees. Yeah, and this is going to especially be useful um, if you're trying to if you have say all the maps tiling at the same rate. You can see there's a clear tall uh, that's repeating the same time across the entire surface. So mm. if you set to offset, you start to get different. Uh, seam areas, which means you can hide the kind of place where it actually starts to tall a bit, a bit better as well. Yeah. So yeah, if I I can adjust the offset here in tiled uh, tile preview, you can see how it works. And it's so cool. I mean, it looks good all the time when you're working. It's not like you're getting. It's just blending together so nicely all the time. I love it. There we go. See, so yeah, we're getting pretty close, I think. Um, might add some more, more height to this as well. There we go. Yeah, look at that. That's pretty close to what I had before. And it's, I mean, it's uh, it's super super simple. It's uh, all I did was color match, and blended and played around with the high and low frequencies, pretty much. Um, and what what I can also do is add some water to this. So it sort of looks like the where is it? The Galapagos Islands, like the volcanic islands. Looks pretty cool. I can play around with the radius of the moistness and the glossiness of it. And this gets me every single time. <laughs> oh. There we go. <laughs> so cool. You know, if you were going to keep water in this, I would probably go with a different depth color to make it look very acidic. Acidic? Yeah, maybe I just make it bluish, maybe? Yeah, something like that. Kind of looks oily. Or like toxic waste, perhaps. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Toxic Avenger. But yeah, this. Uh, so that's pretty much how I created that material. Is um, generally just the. I mean, I, I actually, I actually started working with the with the high and low frequency sliders when. I created this material and I've used it ever since. You can create so many cool uh, results with it. Um, and uh, yeah, none of the materials that I that I loaded look as they are supposed to look. So it's yeah, you really have to be creative and like see materials for what they could be instead of what they are. Um, so yeah. And you uh, you made a you made a tutorial about that as well, uh, Owen. Uh, the ice tutorial was it? Yeah, yeah. I think basically anything. A lot of materials share the same properties, and you can really be creative, uh, like you said, combining the scans to kind of achieve any material. Like even with that crazy green toxic waste color, you could totally make a tolerable weapon camo or something, uh, combining noises and and scan data. Like it's really there's no limit to what you can do. It's mm -hmm. just. If you see sand for sand, you're not going to get much, like, very far. But if you start saying, okay, sand could be snow or, uh, you know, cracked mud could be ice, you can really start to layer things together and get some really cool, uh, really, really cool, unique results. And really, like, with this, the amount of blending you can do here, it just, there's no limit mm. uh, to what you can achieve. 
Alright, so I'm gonna go ahead and save this and stream lava, yeah. And let's check out the other materials. Uh, I have the the dust. I think it's pretty pretty cool. But that's a bit that contains a lot more of materials as they are. Um, but it's let's check it out. I can't remember exactly. I sound sound so prepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Yeah. So. I think I actually use the same, yeah, the same base for these, but I um, just added some stone and um, like dirt on top of it. Let's see here. Yeah, exactly. So I think this is a crushed rock, uh, crushed rock material that I blended in, and this is just another um, like a lighter stone. So yeah, I'm not sure if this is worth showing how I created it. So I can open up the, the plane here. Oh yeah, the plane, I remember this one. <coughs> so yeah, I, um, I'm sorry, if, if you want me to, be, to go more in depth uh, on the features, uh, just let me know Like if, if I'm going too fast or if I'm skipping over things um if i had to hazard a guess yeah i would say that people are mesmerized with what you're doing <laughs> oh yeah yeah this is this is the um this is the material that i use with the like sort of drag marks um you can see here in front of the bomb here i really i really like this because it sort of looks like i don't know it's the explosion like i don't know pressure wave is dragged stuff across the ground and stuff which actually doesn't make sense because the bomb isn't detonated but yeah even <laughs> even things like you know vehicles or or yeah, vehicle, whatever yeah. just scraping yeah. through the ground yeah be creative with the shapes there what does that actually say on the side of it it says our hogs no it says uh war hogs oh yeah i thought it was funny I like war thog war warthog war hog yeah <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, yeah, that that is not textured um, with the studio yet, but it's using Mega Scans materials though. It's uh, made. It's textured with the um, with uh, Diru and Endu, I believe, as well for some details. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I made the bolts and stuff on the side with. And do and the whole thing is textured in uh, Dido with the uh, with materials from Mega Scans. So everything except the backdrop is Mega Scans. It's kind of hard to difficult. <laughs> kind of hard to scan the sky, I think. Uh, so yeah, this is actually the same thing as previous ones. It's using the same um, same base here, so I can actually. Uh, turn off the other materials here let's see no it's actually not using it it's using another base yeah so i can actually go through the different layers here so we can we can talk about how i created this so here i'm i'm pretty much using it straight off the, out of the box uh, a little bit increased or decreased glossiness um high and low frequency are um uh, one one the amplitude is it's pretty high amplitude but it's very very low frequency like below one if we can increase the tiling here we can see just how low frequency frequency it is turn it back off and then i added a, another rock on top of that which i'm using from below so it's pretty much just showing up uh, showing up in the um What's it called? Like in the in the dips in the uh, in the height noise, and I I think I yeah I rotated it and make sure it popped um, showed up in those um, valleys so to speak. Wonder if it happens if I rotate it back? Yeah, exactly. So I'm not I'm not getting the same the same features popping up. We can play around with the radius or threshold here. So that's how that looks. 
and same thing here like I'm just ma color matching in the in the albedo and um, I'm making sure there's some variations in the glossiness like I, I I'm not sure if it's correct but I prefer to have some variations in the glossiness even even if it's not completely accurate to real life I like to have like some light playing around over the surface having some different refractions and stuff um, that, I mean it's just a matter of taste I guess I'm not sure what, yeah, like, what do you think. No one will really mind if there's, you know, no one will say that rock is inaccurate, but people will appreciate some thoughtful effort going into kind of making some variance in the in the roughness and just having a having a bunch of different values on all the surfaces can help because in, in Unreal Engine you can then, you know, use a power node or, or mm -hmm. start to tweak them yourself in there too, which gives you even more control. So just having kind of setting your materials up in Studio with that in mind gives you the most control possible because then you can take what you've made in Studio and further make edits in the engine. Yeah, exactly. It's having some contrast between them allows you to further increase that contrast later on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm using the same mindset when I'm working on hard surface with metals and plastic and stuff. I like even even if this even if it's just aluminium on the entire piece, I like to have some variations in roughness on on the uh, metal, like uh, on a, on a pipe. I like to have the, the different segments on the pipes have different roughness just to just to uh, add some interest. Um, yeah, and like even even just. Never be bogged down by the end result in Studio. Don't be like, oh, this isn't perfect yet. Mm. As long as it's looking good, don't worry about the viewport in, in Studio uh, matching perfectly what you see in Unreal Engine. You'll be able to definitely match it yourself, and yeah. you'll have more control. It's actually more fun to just eyeball it in Unreal Engine than it is to you know try and get the perfect result mm. uh, in here because it just gives you more freedom and control. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's exactly what I did. So first I was going to go with a more dusty look. And then in Unreal Engine, I played around with the materials and I liked them when they were way moist, more moist and like muddy. So, uh, and as you said, Owen, I, that was uh, achieved by playing around with the power, like the contrast and intensity and stuff. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll often stumble upon cool combinations that you otherwise might not have, you know, were. Uh found before especially when you have your material set up you might have three different studio layers in there and then you can start really having fun playing around so it is like a two-step process you get this materials base materials made in studio which are already layered and then layering again in Unreal Engine with other materials you get just so many cool combinations mm. uh, and it's it's a lot of fun totally and um, yeah I noticed here when I was playing around I was I actually used the material that I was talking about, about before the this one here with wavy um, I think it works really, really, really well. It sort of gets that sort of like it's lava going like swelling over uh, in like layering. Uh, so I actually used that. So yeah, I just increased the glossiness and adjusted the uh, the albedo. And I also yeah, I actually kept the high high frequency on that. Let's just see how what it would look like if I oh wrong one sorry. There we go. Yeah, no, that's not gonna work. So, but yeah, it's a pretty cool material. It works re really well for this, for this purpose. And this one is way way more glossy, as you can see here in the roughness or gloss preview. Because I I, I kind of like that. It's kind of sort of been worn away. Like, it's it all used to be like this glossy material before, and then it's sort of worn away uh, over time, and you see this. Uh, like starting to crack and crumble and you see uh, dust and rock forming or pebbles forming I kind of like that that look there and on top of that I added yeah here comes the drag marks which is a yeah it's a soil clay I can view it online so it's in case in case you want to try it yourself so this is the material that I used I'm not sure what, what it is actually. I'm not sure if 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 the person who scanned it just dragged their fingers through the mud or what what it is. And on top of that, I think I, yeah, some rocks on top of it, uh, which is way adjusted in the um, glossiness. Just add some fine details to the um, uh, to the very smooth surface that I added before, and I think I. Yeah, reduce the, yeah, remove the preserved details completely to make it blend super nicely um, with the other other material. 
Yeah, so if I increase the radius, it's gonna blend even more. So that's... Oh yeah, one more material. Which didn't really do much. Let's check it out. Toggle it on and off. Doesn't seem to do anything. Interesting. It might have been one of those layers that you that you put underneath or something. Uh, oh yeah. Sometimes it can get lost. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. Hmm. Well, let's optimize it. There we go. Right, and so those are the materials that I used. Let me just see if there's anything else. I think that's it for this one. And when I export, um, I mean, I've made a couple of these scenes and I'm using uh, a similar setup for them all. Um, so what I do is I export as, let's see here, um, I get the albedo and uh, roughness and normal and in the roughness I set uh, displacement in the G channel and aim occlusion in the B channel because the roughness is just a uh, black and white or grayscale map so uh, I'm, I'm using the two different channel other channels to um, just save some space memory uh, make it easier to organize uh, in Unreal and I, th I think I think it's called RDA packing or do you know Owen? I just whatever I just abbreviate whatever maps are in there. Um, also, I'm curious uh, why you use I mean occlusion versus cavity. Just it's reference. I think in a lot of ways, uh, small details versus larger scale. Yeah, I find I'd the scans not use have cavity. more cavity. Yeah. Oh really? Okay. The uh, uh, I only use roughness albedo. Um, yeah, I mean the maps that I just showed here, and I and I just set a value in Unreal. That's what I did. Okay, it's, it's definitely worth having a look at the cavity. If you go to the, the viewer, um, the PBR viewer at the top left, and just have a look at the cavity data, there's actually, I just find a lot of cool little detail yeah. you can make use of in the engine. It's just a little bonus if you want to, uh, you could mask that, or you could also, you know, deepen it for the shadows, but it's pretty interesting what you can do with it sometimes. Some scans have really nice deep cavity yeah. data. Uh, versus the AO usually tends to be much more broad and not very noticeable, but these get the nice cracks between the rocks and... Yeah, I mean, uh, totally yeah, way more, really cool. way more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you just get much more, you know, detail there, and I, I, I really love using it, especially with those kind of rocky details. You learn something new every day. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> totally gonna try that out. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I already have have them imported, so um, I have to try that off camera. Um, and when imported, like it's sometimes when you import, um, this might turn into a normal map. Um, depending on the values in the um, uh, in the in, in the channels so this one almost looks like looks like a normal map so it might be worth checking out the um, the texture group here or the um, the compression settings uh, I think you went over that as well in your tutorial Owen so yeah it might, might it's totally worth checking out that tutorial because it's really awesome I've checked it out myself several times. Oh, thank you. Yeah, just if, if you're interested in uh, ice material using the uh, cracked scans, you can have a look at that. But definitely important to always double check the compression on the mask when you import them because, like mm. you said, Unreal can assume and you get some weird uh, changes. So yeah. usually I'd, I'd put any packed, any packed maps I'd put to either default or masked or masks. And then obviously normal map, you just flip the Y channel and I'll be able to leave as is. Mm. And yeah, as you might notice, I've I set it to um, uh, no mip, no mip maps, but that, that's just because this is pretty much just a fine render uh, sort of scene. It's not for gameplay at all, as as you saw before. It's <laughs> <laughs> it really just works uh, for panning uh, this this area here, which was its purpose. So that's that's generally how I like to work. If I mean, if, if it's gonna be shown from two angles, make those two angles look awesome. It's no, there's no point in making stuff behind the bomb look good so yeah still does though <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it actually did so yeah <laughs> um so yeah let's check out the material so it's as i said before it's pretty messy and um, i didn't make it uh, for the stream um but it's um it's really just a reflection of my messy head um 
but it's I think it's I think we can make some sense out of it. So what we have here is our the different texture groups, uh, texture, texture set one, two, three. Um, I just uh, multiply it uh, with a um, uh, vector masking the RNG channels, multiplying, and it goes into the um, corresponding texture sets, uh, which are shown, which are mainly located here. Um, up here, we have a, a slope a slope angle which works like this, if I can just scooch some stuff out of the way. So right now the slope is over here, like the slope angle is in this direction here. So if I open up the color picker, we can see that I can control which areas um, are, or like are the actual slope. And in that area, the uh, slope texture set or texture set Three, I believe it is, uh, gets blended in. So I'm using this um, lerping. So I'm using this as an alpha for our lerp. Um, there's a lot of lerp nodes here. Um, Sorcery. Yeah, I'm lerping the lerps into lerps. Um, yeah, a lerp is, it, that's just an um, abbreviation for, or uh, slang for linear interpolation. It's just way easier to say. Um, and there's also a vertex color, but that was just a last minute thing I added because I wanted to find fine detail, like manually paint in some, um, uh, I think it was, yeah, over here I wanted to paint in some um, uh, of the dusty, dusty material that I showed before in some places where it was kind of difficult to um, uh, procedurally blend them in. So actually we can play around with the sliders, we can see what sort of controls we have here but so up here we have we have the three different texture sets and just for the uh, to make it easier they in theory they're just blended like they're just lerped together um, using um, using different values like some are using the displacement to blend some are using um, as, as I show you, showed you before like a um, uh, angle uh, base blend uh, so I'm using height blend, um, but yeah, they're they're just albedo, roughness, dis displacement, uh, normal, uh, nothing fancy going on here, really. And then I have yeah, some. If, if you just think, sorry, one second. If you just think of each component separately as a really simple input, so basically just each material has one albedo, one uh, packed roughness uh, cavity and um, displacement, and then. Normal map. If you just think of them as small, simple components, if that material graph seemed daunting to you, it's actually very much just a bunch of simple components put together. So, mm -hmm. if you're new to this, I'd recommend starting small with one simple material that just goes in straight in from Studio and set that up, and then maybe go to a two material blend. Just slowly work it up because it, it does seem really intimidating if you see this huge graph of nodes. And yeah. Like, what, what is this? There's no way I'll, I'll understand this, but it actually is very simple when you break it down yes. with, uh, step by step. So, I'd, I'd recommend doing that if you're if you're new and you find you know, like a, a three material blend with lots of different slope and various masks intimidating. It, it is it is very much uh, learnable. It's just, just with a bit of time and uh, figuring out the small yeah, segments. Yeah, this is like, there's really nothing fantasy going on in this material. It's just, there's a lot of textures going into it. And that's why it looks really, really intimidating. But it's really just, I'm, I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again. Like I'm, I'm doing the same thing for each normal map. So each normal map have, um, a multiply node with an RGB value, um, RGB node or vector plugged in so I can control the intensity. And then I have a lerp with another one doing the same thing. Um, so it's, it's really, really basic. It's just a lot of textures blended together. So uh, as you said, it's, it's very simple. But um, I mean, I, I guess I could recreate the material from uh, start, like doing some, something similar. Uh, um, to show it off uh, later, if if you're interested, um, but I, I have some uh, some parameters that I always like to add when um, creating materials. Um, it's first of all, it's power, which is pretty much a contrast. Um, then I have uh, intensity for all of the different maps, uh, or most of the maps, and here is something um, called mask divide, and that's what I use to. Uh, control like where the 
ground level is, so to speak. Like, as I said before, I have a height blend, an angle blend, and then I have some uh, displacement um, blending, like, sort of in combination with those blends. So if we check out... No, that's not gonna make it easier to see, but if I find a good angle here... So if I, if I adjust this, we can see that the a material sort of sort of grows up from the bottom of the scene up the hill over there. So let's set it back to where it was before. I can find another angle here. And we increase it and it sort of creeps up the hill. It's very, very subtle how it how it grows. I'm I'm actually pointing on my monitor. Sorry guys. <laughs> Oh yeah, so it grows up there, and that's one uh, blend. And I can also also adjust the intensity of that mask. Um, I can have some different controls for like the intensity and the um, stuff there. It's again nothing fancy. I I can I'm, I can barely remember how I set it up myself uh, now that I look look at it. But it's um, I can we can deep dive uh, dive into it deeply uh, later. Then I have a roughness bias, and that's pretty much just an, a multiply node, which I add uh, right at the end. I can show you uh, here. Uh, roughness bias, if I can find it. Roughness, and it goes back here. Well, it, it's, it has to be somewhere. But it's, yeah, here it is, here it is. It's a roughness bias. So I, I multiply all the roughness, um, uh, rough, roughness masks uh, together, and I add a multiply node here at the end. And that means I can control all the roughness at the same time. Which is pretty handy sometimes if you just want to uh, tweak the overall uh, glossiness or roughness of the, um, of the material. Uh, and then same thing, pretty much the same thing as I had before with the height mask. I have with the slope mask, I have like the tightness of the blend and um, so on. Um, it's just uh, to tweak it pretty much. And then here I have three different intensities for the, um, uh, the for the displacement. So this material uses um, a real-time tessellation. So if I zoom in here, we can check that out. So I think, yeah, the first displacement is over here. Yep, exactly. So we can increase that. I I'm Real not sure how the, how the frame rate is, but uh, I'm gonna do it slow. Real quick. Yeah. <laughs> We uh, we don't mind if you guys talk. So if you need to say anything or if you have any questions, by all means, reach out. Yeah, the chat is very, very, very quiet. Feel free to ask anything. There's no stupid questions. And yeah, so these just control the intensity of the displacement. And here's the slope displacement over here. Kind of over there. It's in the shade, but yeah. You get the point. Whoops. Nope. There we go. And down here we have just so, so I can so we can tint the material. Um, yeah, we can see it here. There's a slight tint to it. Um, we have a normal intensity. Um, I'm not sure. Do you usually do use that, Owen? Yeah, very much. I actually don't do it the way you're doing it, but it doesn't. There's so many ways of doing it like this. Uh, How do you I just do have it? a little material function. I just I, I try to take anything that I'm repeating across the material into a function so that I can just have one node instead of uh, a few. Oh. In this case, it's not a big deal because it's just one multiply node with a with a vector. But it's handy to if you if you find yourself doing a lot of things frequently and just clogging up your nodes, it's int it's uh, really easy to make a function and then reuse it over and over. Mm. But um, I'd say in general, boosting normals is a big thing you should always be testing out with uh, with these scans because some of them look really good with a boosted normal, especially rocky or very fine details. Uh, it's easy to go too far too, but in general it's it's really cool. And uh, I'd, I'd always have a strength multiplier on every normal map. Mm. Individually, so you can control this, the strength of each material. But yeah. Yeah, so you can create some really, really different results by playing around with this. So much fun. Yeah, and then I have, let's see here. Yeah, the slope angle that I showed you before. I have an overall subsurface color. Uh, like for some materials, like I've made some snow scenes and desert scenes. Um, I like to be able to 
Um, just sort of add... Like, in this scene, it's not going to work. Well, maybe if I make it sort of bluish and super subtle. I can, you, you, can, you can increase the... Um, decrease the strength of the shadows and stuff. You can you can get some cool results from that, um, but for this scene, it's not it's not working. Um, and then here I have the tiling. Uh, I'm I'm sure there's a there's a handy node like pre-made tiling node. Uh, do you know if there's one, Owen? Uh, no, I think the way you're doing it is either that way or just multiplying a straight scalar. But the way you're doing it actually gives an advantage if you wanted to stretch things a bit more. If you wanted, for example, uh, to stretch just in one axis like you're doing there, it should be just moving in the X. Um, so basically that or just a scalar parameter in is the standard way to go mm. uh, for telling. But uh, it's, it's easy enough to set up. Yeah. So the way I set that up was it's a texture coordinate multiplied by a masked um, vector, three vector. So what I'm doing here is um, I'm just making sure that only the RNG channels are being used uh, as the texture coordinate or uh, is only a U and V uh, two values. Uh, and then I plug that into the UVs here. So I have control over the two um, separate, uh, the U and V channels or uh, What's it called? Directions? X and y. Axis? Yeah. Yeah. And if, if you were just going for, if you didn't want to ever change the uh, ratio, if you wanted to always keep it square tiled, all you got to do is put a scalar, one scalar into the multiply node, and uh, that'll do it as well. Yeah, so if exactly. you didn't want to ask, say, if you're confused by that, it's just you put a scalar in there and you're, you're all good. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's, that's how I do it. And um, I'm thinking how I best go about creating a new material. I'm thinking what I could do is just open my, open up my studio scene and create the material um, from one of these uh, that I just exported. Um, or do you have a better idea? I think that sounds good. Maybe we could do a simple, uh, maybe even two layer blend or something. Um, just to show that it's really the power is, if you were just to take one studio material and throw it on this landscape, you'd obviously notice the tiling, but a little bit of simple blending and masking can go a long way to just make it seem infinite. Like this material like this material looks, you can't notice the tiling, you can't see the seams, it just looks mm. perfect all the way. So a little bit of masking goes a really long way to uh, to help yeah. kind of drive the realism and move tiling. Yeah, totally. Oh yeah, and just gonna show I show the 3D assets here and these rock faces here or cliff faces here are just downloaded uh, from Megascans uh, very basic very basic materials I've just uh, adjusted the power intensity um, uh, desaturation um, and they are just so good for dressing up the like edges of maps uh, there are like I think they added several new, uh, new, uh, more of these recently, didn't they? Yeah, yeah there's a, they're really amazing, and I can't say enough how much a few vertical elements that kind of give some height to your scene can help. Yeah. Because if you're just working on a flat plane or a slightly subdivided plane, and you're just trying to get the materials to look right, it's often really helpful to have just a big vertical, like that wall to the left, instantly kind of grounds the scene and gives you mm. some perspective. Uh, so it's really, really useful to have those around. That being said, uh, we do have a question or basically a comment, I suppose. Uh, one of the users would like to know, oh, <laughs> let me rephrase this. He says a basic blend material would be great, maybe a slope example and a height example. Sure, uh, if I can remember how to do it, but um, let's, um, let's just real quick, just set up a material here. Um, like, so, we, so we go through the whole, um, the whole pipe, like from the studio to Unreal. So here's just a quick studio I set up here. And just hide this rock here. And I'll apply just that one there. Just make a new material. Actually, I have to move this stuff over here so we you can see what I'm doing. And there we go. And the content browser. There we go. So I'll just create a material. All this stream, not steam, stream example. Apply that and open it up. So 
come on there we go so I'll just do find a slope and drag the textures in so I want the slope albedo the slope normal and the slope roughness switch places and first of all what I do is I just plug them straight in actually the R value here and most of the time it looks good out of the box I can do a plane here instead or I can just apply it and check it out in the um, in the viewport and there we go so for in my taste it's a bit too um, too glossy so what I do then is in the material here I just multiply by not a three vector a one vector uh, I like to convert it to a parameter by right clicking because if I if I then create an instance um, these uh, parameters are exposed so you can change them in uh, preview in real time so that's really really handy so I'll name this uh, roughness bias multiply that with the red channel plug that in I actually set it to uh, no, I'll leave it like this and I'll show you the instance later and for albedos, I always like to uh, do the same thing. I multiply and do name this albedo int for albedo intensity. Set it to one and plug that in there. And as a last step, I like to add a power, which uh, as uh, Owen talked about before is um, sort of like contrast. So I plug this in here and add a one vector again name this albedo power set it to one as default value plug that into exponent and then i clamp this so we don't go above one there we go that's really important like you can get some really strange results something i mean some if, if you want strange results and some really overblown stuff that's fine but i, I like to clamp it so i never go above one and here for the normal map um, my approach uh, is to same thing here normal int set it to one in all these multiply that and then if you want you can do a normalize uh, normalize uh, before we plug in to make sure it's got some nice and tidy values and that's pretty much what I do for a basic material and now if I save this and close it down and find it here again where is it it's stream example and I make a material instance here by right clicking I can immediately preview um, when I when I change these parameters so if I increase the roughness bias we see it becomes more rough and if I decrease it turns into a mirror so I like to create instances when I work just because you can instantly see just what you're like when you're changing uh, instead of changing a value clicking apply going into the viewport and back and forth so this is just way easier plus it looks it feels kind of cool to have parameters exposed like this yeah and this is exactly what we were talking about earlier um, it's so fast and easy to see changes right away so yeah. never be too perfect with your studio materials because there's so much you can do after to make it look even cooler so yeah it's really cool that in unreal engine yeah there's no compile there's no wait times once you have the instance set up you can just go ahead and tweak away and everything updates right away so it's really really powerful mm -hmm. but it's good it's, it's good practice because once you have one material you can just do uh, create instances and instances um uh, based on the same master material so if you change something in the master material if you realize oh crap i have to invert this you just invert it in the master and it's going to update and all uh, for all the instances you made plus it's uh, instanced so it's just way cheaper uh, instead of having uh, one uh, like one master material for each asset yeah it's it's so powerful I, i'd recommend having like a, a separate master material for every major Material types, so yeah. say water would have a different one to uh, make a sound. And then I, I might have certain blend ones. If you wanted a cheaper material, you can have a cheap blend master material, and so on. This is, you can do as many as you want, but it's so handy to have it all under, have as many instances as you want under one master material, which can then update, like you said. Yeah. And yeah. Here, here is just an uh, albedo int. So I mean, I can boost this all like to in absurd numbers, but it's never gonna um, go above one because of that um, clamp that I put there. 
and that's the exact reason because um, if I would go to two, it might uh, cause blooming and stuff, and uh, if I don't, like where I don't want it. So I can increase the intensity and the brightness without going overboard. So I, I don't know. Uh, is that something you do as well? I tend to always have a fairly bright albedo, which I then use the intensity to reduce. But I always have a intensity parameter like this as well. Mm. Uh, I usually never get that dark, but for this case, it's perfect because you're over dark stone. But uh, yeah, also I'd always have the cavity multiplied after to further tweak that as well. But that's just uh, preference, I think. Yeah, I have to start playing around with the cavity. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, because you then you could like adjust the uh, crevices and stuff here. Yeah, you can even not even use it as a cavity map and have say darker values. So if you're doing uh, say an orange rock, you could have deep red values in the cracks or whatever. Mm. It's really powerful. You can basically mask the cracks by that way. Yeah. So yeah, this is just the contrast. Uh, I'm not sure if we can see it very well here. Uh, at least I can't because I have the sun in my eyes. But if I increase this, yeah. Yeah, I should have. Wonder why I get that. Didn't I clamp the albedo power? Yeah. Oh, oh well. Uh, set it one. And so yeah, that, that's how I create that basic material. And now we haven't really covered the um, displacement, which is also a pretty important part. So I like to use the PN triangles and adaptive tessellation. And sometimes I'm getting some weird, weird bugs. Like it's uh, sort of flickering in near the camera's edges, uh, especially when I'm in, uh, at like lower uh, fobs or field of use. So I like to set it to this to 30, and that will that will reduce or remove all the sort of cracking, like the, the holes appearing in the mesh. Um, or like, have you ever had that, Owen? Yeah, I've had a lot of issues with uh, displacement in general. <clears throat> I definitely would do the same thing. Um, I also usually turn off adaptive because oh. mainly for if you do cinematics, uh, I find that you can notice oh, the landscape yeah. kind of kind of flickering and moving and kind of changing shape because what it's doing is basically, depending on your camera angle, it's making the best displacement for that angle, but you might notice some Good you know, weird warping happening. So I, I usually have it disabled. Yeah. And also just to note quickly, uh, for if you're doing landscapes, uh, large landscapes, be very careful with displacement, and definitely, if you are, if it's necessary, always mask it by distance, um, because it gets ridiculously expensive and unreal. Yeah, it tends to have a really big base cost for this for uh, tessellation right now. So uh, just to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And here is I'm, I'm I'm just really quickly setting up the uh, displacement here. So I'm multiplying it with a vertex normal vertical space. And then I'm multiplying that with a constant here. Oh, yes, yeah, call a constant, not a one vector. A constant, that's the name. Sorry, I'm saying it wrong all this time. Uh, I'll call this uh, displacement int and set it to one for now, and plug this into world position or a, a world displacement. And here I'll just create a constant, uh, not the parameter in the tessellation multiplier. Yeah, that's this is how like how highly it's going to be tessellated the mesh. So I think yeah, four, how many times four is the max. I think you can actually go higher in the newer versions, but it gets really heavy. So mm. that's the thing you would learn by distance if you were going to do a really large landscape. Yeah, exactly. So uh, do you use a scene depth for that? Uh, yeah, scene depth or camera depth, uh, or else you can do Sometimes I do it by this. There's a few different ways actually. I can I can probably put that together in a future tutorial. But mm -hmm. yeah, generally cheapen it up as much as you can. But for a scene like this, it's perfect to just uh, throw in a constant because you just want the detail of where. Yeah. So let's go ahead and save this and um, play around with the instance here, so we can see it in real time. It might displace a little bit here um, straight away because I set it to one, but I don't think so. Uh... Yeah, there we go. We have to go pretty high. So let's find a nice angle here and increase it. Is it like 20? Whoa, not... There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, now we're getting some nice variations or height variations. Might it actually go even higher, like 35. And what you could do is you could clamp, like if you're getting peaks like this, like of course you could go back and, and uh, change the um, the mask, the map in um, in the studio, or you could go into Photoshop, whatever, and change it there, or you could just add a clamp or something like that in 
um, uh, in, in the material editor. Or actually, maybe you could do a I'm thinking. Or maybe uh, is is clamp the best way to go about it? Yeah, honestly, I it's kind of hard sometimes. You get just really areas that are really high up, and you can't really do much about it. I haven't really done many clamping because I think that kind of gives a harsh edge to it. Yeah, it's probably gonna be, yeah, close. like a plateau. Yeah, yeah that uh, that's not gonna work. Ignore that. That was a bad bad advice. <laughs> But yeah, so this is this is just a really basic material. Uh, there is no blending or anything at all. Um, it's just textures straight in uh, with some um, parameters exposed you can uh, play around with. And uh, that's it. And then you can do, um, yeah, like all sorts of blending, like angle blends. You can do um, height blends. You can also do vertex blending where you can like actually paint. Uh, using the vertex paint uh, tool here, that's usually what I do. Like the um, uh, the reason why I didn't do it for the other scene was just because I wanted to challenge myself and try and do something different. But usually the that's my favorite kind of material. Um, yeah, did I did I did I forget anything? Oh, I think you nailed it. Uh, just to uh, go on on that. Sorry, there's a bit of echo there. Uh, one sec. Uh, I'm not sure if it's gone. Uh, it's still echoing, sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, just to say, sometimes it's good to have an automated blending system if you have a very large landscape, because you basically get free blending without any annual painting, which can be really useful if you uh, if you're basically have a huge terrain or a huge area that you want to just get the materials going. If you set up those systems, the masks and everything, you will have basically uh, instant blending on any, you can swap out the mesh, you can swap out the terrain and you'll get instant blending, which is really cool. So, mm. um, yeah. And we could actually take a look because honestly, I can't remember exactly how I set that up. So what we can do is we can dissect the material that I created here instead. Um, and let's go up here. So, what I'm doing here is um, I'm dotting a vertex normal with a vector, RGB vector, and I'm subtracting this with a constant. This is start blend, or like the start of the blend. I can show you what the, these two parameters do later on, or three um, parameters do later on. Um, but here, so I'm subtracting this dot with um, uh, uh, a value here, dividing this with the end blend, the constant here, and then I'm just clamping that um, 0 to 1. And this uh, I'm using uh, in a, in lerps here. Uh, I think it's the, yeah, it's the first, yeah, it's the first lerp, exactly. Then I'm lerping on, to, uh, on the third layer later on. So, like the first uh, layer is this, or layer and layer, but like the first uh, texture set is this, then it's the, um, the slope, and then it's the dusty material uh, that you can see in some places. So it's really basic, uh, actually. Um, so if we check out the start and end blend as well as the, um, yeah, the angle we looked at before. So let's get over here and find. Uh, oh no, that's not the one. Where is it? Slope, albedo, power, slope. Oh yeah, I have a power there as well, just to uh, sort of uh, further uh, have control. Whoops. I'm trying to remember exactly how how this works. Like I'm. It's really easy if you want to debug it. You can put in two colors, just like a right two bright different colors into the lerp and then mask that and then you'll instantly see uh, what the mask is doing and where it's it's going to be pretty hard when you have a lot of similar materials blended together to yeah see, uh where it's going yeah what i could do yeah uh, it might be overkill what i could do is create a new material with these and just lerp two different colors i guess i could do that um got a question for you oh yeah shoot so chaos range wants to know what are all of the things that you have in your study scene 
do you use that scene to render your materials for show in your portfolio, etc.? Oh no, it's it's uh, it's actually just a where is it? Here we go. Um, it's actually just something that I made to, as we do now, like try out the materials uh, in Unreal that I make in the studio. Um, pretty much just like like a, like a playground scene, see how stuff works together. Uh, try um, try different different materials that I create, like blending stuff like that. Um, that's pretty much just what it what it's for. And the reason why I have these. Like it's, it's actually pretty much just for fun. Like I want, it to, I want it to look like a studio. So I, I can actually just take these and move them around, um, like I would in a studio. So if I like, actually if if I like how something looks, uh, like a photograph looks or a studio presentation, I try and figure out how that studio looks, like that kind of studio setup looks, and then I can just shuffle these umbrellas and boxes around. Um, to sort of mimic that, so that's the only reason why I have this uh, this scene. Does that answer your question? I would think it would. Cool. Yeah. What are all the things you have? Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah, the things here. It's th these are pretty much just rep rep representations of things that you would find in a studio, a real studio. Um, I think this is called this is called a light box. I'm not sure. Um, let's, oops, take a look at this. It's a very simple mesh here. And then I have these umbrellas. Um, like it's, it's actually like subsurface material on it, but it doesn't really, it doesn't affect the lighting. It's just a reflection, um, real time reflection, um, that it affects. And this backdrop here doesn't really affect anything because the lighting is not baked. It's just there for sort of like the cube map uh, that I've uh, created here for the ambient cube map in the post process. And uh, instead I'm actually using a um, directional light for the um, sort of like a bounce light. It's not really showing up on this, but if I show this rock here, we can see it a bit more clearly. So everything's just fake pretty much. It's just, I like to work this way when I preview stuff. It's a nice controlled environment. Any more questions? Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, where were we? We were in in this scene for some reason. Oh yeah, uh, were we going to create a slope? Yeah, we're going to create a slope material. So I'm going to copy this. I hope I can copy it over to the studio because that would make it a lot easier. Um, so create a new material slope example open this up and fingers crossed yep there we go awesome so i'm going to create two rgb vectors here one red and one will be green like really obnoxiously green and then we'll just create a lerp between those two Okay, there we go. And I'll use this as the mask. I will plug this into Emissive instead of Albedo. And just save that. And what I'll do now is I will... Actually, we can just create a sphere and apply it to it. So yeah, this is one of the reasons why I like having a scene like this. It's just it's very it's lightweight, lightweight. It's got some nice lighting. It's just control lab sort of environment. Uh, I'll create a instance and just apply that. So here is where the slope is. So just you just have to imagine this is a uh, environment. So if I open this up, scooch over a bit and enable these parameters. We can adjust the uh, direction here. We can adjust the the um, in, like the tightness or fall off of the uh, what's it called the blend. Make it softer or harder. Uh, you can also invert it if you go over the other value. Woo! <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the blend that I use for my for those um, sort of like um, 
what's it called like movie set scenes um, of course you you would need a bit more elaborate a bit of a, a bit more elaborate setup if you were using it for an actual like game uh, landscape uh, but for uh, scenes like this the something simple like this works uh, just fine yeah um that's actually what I wanted to show. I think. Um, am I am I missing anything, John? Are you are you trying to weasel out of this early? <laughs> totally. No, no, no. I can I can go on for a really long time. I'm just not sure what else I can show in regards to the scene here. Um, I think I've gone over most stuff. We can take a look at the material for the. Rock faces here as well. I think it's just, as I said before, is extremely basic. Yeah, it's pretty much what I created for the um, example material, except I imported, I think, a gloss. Yeah, a gloss map with it, which I just inverted, added a switch here in case I wanted to, um, in case other assets have a roughness instead of gloss, so I can just toggle this on and off in the uh, instance here. And yeah, bias. So that's super, super basic here as well. Um, really, this scene is extremely basic. It's even it's just using one uh, light source as well. Um, I think it's got yeah, it's got a skylight, but I don't think it's no, it's not doing anything. It's uh, disabled. Um, so it's extremely freaking simply simple uh, setup. Um, no, no fancy fill lights or no cube maps. It's just one directional light, light in the entire scene. It's uh, yeah, and a lot of the work is being done in the uh, where is it? The post process volume. So we can turn that off. We can just see exactly how much is being done here. Is it like here is pretty. Like the contrast is way off, the colors are sort, of, sort of like greenish, I think, green blue, and it all really just comes together when I turn this on. Like it almost, it almost looks like I like I turn on a fill light here, like on the bomb. Like I'm saying bombs many times. I think the NSA is gonna come after me soon. <laughs> so yeah, that's like the it's, it's like mega scans. This is mega scans. So we so so simple to create something cool. It's I you know, love it. there's something else to get you to. Yeah. Um, you're using a cinematic camera, right? Uh, no, it's just a regular regular camera. I just lowered the field of view from ninety. Uh, okay, I was going to say that you could put more of your post processing into the camera so that you can get more uh, specific targeting for each shot that you want to make. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I actually have never used a cinematic camera. You should. Tell me, how do I do it? You create a cinematic camera. <laughs> That's all you have to do. <laughs> how do I draw a figure? You draw a figure? Uh, let's see here. So, I'm guessing... Uh, where is it? Rendering? No. Give me something. Where is it? I think the menu, that the asset menu to the left, that's a default, the top left, it's not there right now, but that's where you would create it. Um, if you just hit shift one and you'll open it up. Shift one? Yep, shift one. Oh, the mode is over here, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so if you go to uh, cinematic, I guess, or, yeah. Cin if you just type, yeah, there it is. camera actor. Interesting. Yeah, this one is based more on actual film cameras rather than uh, the default camera. So it's kind of hard to get in depth on, but I covered a lot of it in the last stream that we did. Ooh. But you can actually get different uh, types of film back settings for this too to emulate different SLR types. Where is look pilot? through? Yeah, pi oh yeah, pilot. Look at this. And it comes at depth of field automatically. Yeah. Wow. This is cool. If you want to change that, open up your settings and I'll show you how to do it. Settings, set. oh, yeah, it's it's down here. Oh, you and your weird lamp. Yeah, this is right, not a, like, I usually I have everything on the other other screen and just have this full screen pretty much. Right. And 
Yeah, scroll down. Scroll down. You uh, have to select your uh, camera component. Yeah, you got to select the camera. But I think he did select. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it is. The component in yeah. the under the scene component. It should be showing up with the options. See there under scene component right there. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you're good. All right. So oh, if you want to change the uh, what do you call it the depth of field, the best way to do that is to change the focus distance. Oh wow, this is really cool. Like how I almost missed this. I feel like such a noob right now. <laughs> no offense to the other people who didn't know about this. <laughs> wow, you can it's relatively new. Wow. Look at all this stuff. This is this is really really powerful. Old school kind of camera. So if you open up the focus settings rollout. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Change yeah, so change the leave it on man or manual for now. Wait, tracking is this automatic depth of field? Yeah, it'll try to remember where you were last, but um, put it on manual for now. You goofball. Get back where you were. <laughs> uh, where, oh, yeah. Manual. Yeah, manual. And then draw debug focus plane so you can actually see where it's focusing at. And then it's going to be a big purple line. You can't see it because it's too far out. Go ahead and drag it. Stop. Stop, Stop it. <laughs> Stay put. Okay, pull it back until you get where you can actually oh. see it. Now you can see where you're focusing. Wow. This. I wish I would have known about this before. Yeah, so if you focus on the bomb. On the bomb, you yeah. Just chill, just chill out for a sec. Just chill out for a sec. Okay, focus so should the bomb. the bomb be inside the. Inside so the line? The, line or... the purple line that you see is actually going to be the uh, area of focus. Okay, so, so yeah, so you should be dead in the center. Yes, and what's going to control your depth of field is going to be your aperture setting. Right, yeah. So you're, if your current aperture is 2.8, you can put it down to 0.1 to really blow it out and make it look very. Uh, You'll see what I mean. Try point one. Oh, you can't go any lower than that unless you change the uh, go down a little bit, or maybe it's up. You should be able to change the the lens type to a minimal. Well, not that lens, but rather uh, where the hell is it? It's in, it's in the settings somewhere, but you can change the minimum aperture. Okay. Actually, if you just type aperture in the search bar at the top, you should be able to find it pretty easy. Nope. Okay. Uh, weird. What version of Unreal are you on? I, I hope the viewers are learning something from this as well. Otherwise, we're just... <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, don't worry. It's it's something, at least it ties into what you're doing, because it does show how to how to show off the work that you do. Yeah. If you um, the min f stop, you should be able to uh, decrease that under lens settings. Lens settings? Yeah. yeah there it is. Right there. Oh. You change min f stop. Set it to zero, so we can just do whatever we want with it. Not the focal length, but the, uh, the f stop. Oh, right. So, like, this is trying to emulate how a camera would function, but the problem is that it doesn't actually compensate for exposure. Mm. Uh, F-stop is basically the way of... You're contr it's controlling the size of your camera's, like, iris, the, how big the iris gets. So when it goes down to, like, 0.1, the iris is, like, gigantic. Oh, it and what like that should toy. do... Right, and what that should do is that actually open up the, the lens to so much light that the scene should look blown out, but that mm -hmm. it's not doing that. So you'd have to, like, compensate with post-processing and stuff to get that appearance that you'd want. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you, you can definitely see the the depth of field and how it works. It's really cool. Wow, this is so cool. <laughs> doing cinematics, you can actually pick an actor to track uh, while you're doing the cinematics. So if you had a car going in the road and you wanted some really tight depth of field, you can actually have it track the car in every frame and perfectly focus, which is really cool, which means you don't have to manually adjust for each frame. Uh, so it would focus like a real camera. Um, it's pretty, really cool. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, I'm completely gobsmacked here. This is so cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So go create the cinematic camera actor, guys. Yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. If you want to see what my camera looks like, go to uh, scroll up a little bit and change the film back to micro four thirds. Micro. The very, bottom. The very bottom. Oh, there. That's what I use. And the, the beauty of this system is that every lens that you use is doubled. So a 35 millimeter lens is actually a 70 millimeter lens. Oh. So you're, you're looking at everything in 70 millimeters right now rather than in 35. Cool. So, like I've got a giant 300 millimeter lens and it actually doubles the focal length at 600. So you could, you could zoom in on a plane up in the sky, like cruising at stratosphere uh, height. 
and still pick out the plane from that distance. Nice. But yeah, there's a, there's a ton of options for this thing, so it's it's totally worth playing with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, cameras are my thing, so I'll sit here and talk about them all day. Yeah, I don't really know much about cameras. Like point and click. But yeah, so I, I usually... Like, I'm not going to do it anymore, but for this scene, I am going to jump out of this. There we go. I did most of the work in the post-process settings. So I am using both... Uh, like in the, I think it was 4.15, correct me if I'm wrong, they added the um, uh, the new tone mapper. But I am, yeah, I'm yes. using that in, in combination with um, color grading or a lookup table. So uh, let's turn that off and on. So it's a lot of the work is done there and I'm also doing uh, some work in the the different uh, like the saturation uh, for shadows, midtones, highlights, and so on. And I th yeah, most most post process settings are almost like turned off. I don't think I have much. Yeah, I don't have any image occlusion at all. Um, there shouldn't be much bloom. Uh, where is it? This no bloom. Yeah, 0.5, Okay, I was lying. But yeah, it's it's very bare bones. Um, there's no depth of field at all in the um, uh, in scene as it is right now. I might actually try and set something cool up with the cinematic camera now that I know about it. Um, might be really cool, um, worth a shot. Yeah, it's really really good if you make a cool scene like this and you want to actually even just get cool stills from it. But you, like sequencer, the new cinematic tool is amazing, and you yeah. can just get some amazing playthroughs and really show off the the way the light hits the surfaces as the camera moves you know there's a lot of really cool things you can do yeah. so it's incredibly powerful it's literally like a full feature video editor right in the right in the engine it's just yeah. really really cool yeah i love doing these, these like really really slow fly throughs like pants yeah wow yeah that's gonna be cool uh, do we have any any more questions in the chat there's people talking, but nothing generally specific that we can talk about. Yeah, there was a yeah. reference More to competitor software, but yeah. we, we generally avoid talking about competitor software. It's just not professional. No. But just our texture scan is not too happy for the engine. It doesn't matter texture to texture. It doesn't matter if it's scanned or not. You're going to get the same performance if it's the same uh, format. So just to address that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely usable. There's been games that have used uh, photogrammetry before. Um, yeah, Ethan wasn't Carter. It? Yeah, and wasn't it the the other Battlefield game, the World War One version, that did a lot uh, of that? Battlefield One, basically, yeah, like it's often maybe a misconception that just because there's so much detail packed into the scans that they're more expensive or whatever. But it's really, just a it's, texture. It's another texture map. That's all it is. So it's yeah. the same exact thing, and plenty of games. Uh, in the years to come, there's going to be basically any game in for realism is 100% going to be using scans. So in some fun. ways, I would go as far as to say that the the scans are probably going to run better, just because you don't have to do as much work to them to make them function correctly inside mm. of the engine. Like yeah, they look exactly. Good like, out of the box. You need actually way more elaborate uh, shader setups if you wanted to emulate a lot of the stuff you get for free packed into the map. So it's certainly uh, something to think about there too. Mm. Yeah, like I mean, if you, 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 I just show you like how easy it is to set up the maps. It's pretty much just plug and play. If you've ever looked at some of the Unreal Three uh, material setups from Epic, some of those are a good example of like what you're getting for free now. You had to go through a ton of material work to get mm -hmm. back in the day. Mm -hmm. I, I I remember looking at plants when I was building some of my student projects when I was still in college. Oh, someone. I think he, he dropped that there. No, <laughs> right in the middle of his story. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Back. <laughs> I just got completely cut off. Nice work, Google Hangouts. Anyway, I was saying that uh, I remember looking at the Unreal 3 stuff when I was in college trying to learn how they built the materials, and I don't even, like, I, I distinctly recall looking at some of the foliage setups when I was, I was building, like, ferns and whatnot, and some of these things had, like, hundreds of nodes inside of them, and it was just, it was, like, trying to decipher the Rosetta Stone. I'm like, I don't even know what I'm looking at. Yeah, basically all the very, they can go insane. Like, it's really, I respect usually because they're extremely talented to be able to do that kind of stuff in the shader, but basically they're, they're turning like hundred, like a lot of nodes to try and just get a realistic stone effect or whatever. As for, we're getting all of this stuff right off the bat for free. So it, it's mm -hmm. kind of, 
you got to take that into account. You can get some ridiculously simple setups if you wanted. You could just simply plug in all the maps as they are and get the exact look of the material. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's good to get some control, but if you really want to be super performant, you can pack it in. You can get really simple setups and basically, you know, have really good performance. So, performance is definitely not tied to visual quality. It's something that you got to consider. Uh, just the input and how complex your shader is. For sure. And with that being said, we do have a question from a uh, new lab. I would assume that's how you pronounce it. Uh, yeah. He wants to know if you have any plans to make your scene available for study after the stream, or is that not possible considering it's using paid content? The, I don't know, actually. I'll, uh, I'll look into it. It's not impossible. Um, but I'll, yeah, my answer will be maybe. Hopefully. The there is precedent for this. I mean, the last stream that I did on the ethanol train project that I, I showed off, uh, all of the stuff that I built in Megascan Studio, I gave away. I had no problem with that, um, mostly because it's it was location-specific, if you want to call it geo-specific. I mean, it was built to look like Florida, so you're not going to take that and sell it somewhere. It's very obvious if you did. Um, but, I mean, for stuff like this, I mean, it's up to you, really, since it is your project. But, I mean... If nothing else, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, ultimately it's up to you. I'm not going to speak for you on your behalf for that one. Well, it's, yeah, it's up to Quixel, I guess. It's made for Quixel, so. Yeah, but hopefully, like, I, I, would, I, would, I would love to do that. That's a really good idea. And maybe I could also up, optimize it a bit more and actually set up a proper camera um, now that I know about it. Cinematic camera. Yeah, yeah. exactly. To make it look better that, and look and run better. Get that depth of field going, look real yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, maybe I, I could also make these available somehow so you can look at these. I don't know. Um, I could save them out as, um, as a surface, I guess. And then make them available if that's um, of interest. Uh, are you still there? I think yeah, I'm still there. Yeah, Jonathan is muted. Uh, yeah, I'm actually just. Are you talking to me? I was typing to somebody in chat. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I was just talk, speaking out loud. I guess. Harder, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I, I completely glossed over. What did you want to ask me? Something? I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 No, it was fine. It was just I was talking about maybe I could uh, set, uh, like make these um, services that I just talked about in the stream um, available services uh, for download. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't see why not. Yeah, honestly, if, if there's interest, uh, I could do it. I think there's interest. I mean, there was people asking about it. Oh, really? I, I did relay the question to you. <laughs> <laughs> Her der. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, so far, I mean, this has been a pretty good stream. Yeah. Um, we can continue for another half hour, but if you guys are you know, satisfied with what you have now, we can call it quits early. It's really up to you guys. It's all being done for you and your benefit. So if you want any other questions answered, now would be the time to ask. Dun, dun, dun. Cinematic lights. Um... Yeah, While I mean, we're on the subject, man, that cinematic camera is something else. I was so happy when they came out with that. It really blows the original camera out of the water in every, pretty much every aspect. Yeah, I totally missed it. Like, I, I thought everyone, everyone was talking about the tone map, and I was like, oh, that's so awesome. But now that I learned about the camera, I see why people got so excited. Yeah, I mean, really, really powerful. Yeah. when I was doing the, uh, and there's a question I'll relay in a second, but when I was doing the ethanol train project, there was a part where like, I was so happy because it felt like I was taking my Olympus camera and just running around in the woods. Oh, yeah. that, that's, that's all I did. Like Once I set up the scene, I was free to just run around inside of my little world that I had built, and it felt like I was doing something I would normally do, which is go out and get in the trouble taking pictures of stuff I'm not supposed to take pictures of. So <laughs> I've, I've had chats with the FBI before about that. They're not terribly thrilled with me taking pictures of infrastructure. What, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, back in 05, I went out on a late night trip trying to make a video game deathmatch map around like an oil tanker thing. Mm -hmm. And when where I lived in the at this point, it was like up in the panhandle of Florida next to a huge Air Force base. And I went out and took pictures of the oil tankers and there was a cop that was following me. And I didn't know he was following me. So when I went into 
uh, get a couple more reference shots of something else. I came out of the woods and there was like an, an, the entire city's police department what? there pointing guns. Yeah, they were all there pointing guns at me, and they had like a canine unit and everything. And I just, I'm just like, okay, well, I mean, at this point, I had like shorts on and flip flops, and I had really long hair like Billy does, mm -hmm. and I looked like a complete total like. Uh, hippie. I look, I look like a hippie coming out of the woods, right, with a camera around my neck. I just put my hands up. I'm like, okay, yep, please don't kill me. I don't want to die. I don't have anything. Yeah, I had to sign a paper saying the FBI would come talk to me, and sure enough, in the morning, I woke up at like 10 after I went to bed at 3, and there was these two men in black there like wow. at my door. I mean, literally men in black. I mean, it's two dudes in a suit, and they're just like, can we... uh can we see what you were working on? What were you doing? And I'm like, oh, okay. So I pulled up Max. Like It was like Max 4 or something at this point in time. Uh -huh. And uh, I showed it to him. I'm like, I looked at him like, hey, this looks pretty cool, right? It's like this blocky looking piece of crap. Like, <laughs> I, had, I had no artistic talent back then. And they're like, this is the stupidest thing we've ever been called out to come investigate. And they just left. Yeah. And that was the end of it there. Um, wow. So uh, as, far as, as far as questions go, um, I'll I'll be right back. Two minutes. I'm very sorry. No, I was gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back. Damn it! All right. Well, I guess in the meantime, yes, there is a workflow for mixing external maps into MegaScan Studio. It should be a pretty simple import option. I haven't done it in a while since I haven't really opened up Studio since I last worked on my project, but it should be pretty simple. I mean, it the whole thing has been developed specifically just to have a lot of ease of use so the it should just be like file import if I'm not mistaken that's really not hard as long as you have all the maps calibrated correctly or at least relatively correctly it should come out okay and I'm, I'm sorry for those of you guys who are listening um, my name is Jonathan I'm, I'm the uh, community manager for Quixel I also run development for Quixel Suite in the background I'm usually the guy that has to approve a lot of the uh, updates and whatnot to Suite before it gets pushed so if you you know find any bugs in the tools come yell at me and I'll you know, try to get it fixed. And I also sound a little weird right now too, because I'm I got a cold two days before the stream. My best luck, right? So I kind of sound like Barry White right now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's see what else. Um, yeah, if you guys don't have any other questions, I guess when Victor comes back, we can wrap this up. Unless you have anything else we haven't covered. But it's definitely for you that we're doing this. So <laughs> you know, it's it's good to have you guys here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to interact with you guys. We have a really good community, and it's always awesome to see what you're doing. Um, if you haven't been yet, while we're again while we're waiting for him to come back, I'm and while you're, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish my sentence, damn it. Uh, while we have got Victor back, I would ask and recommend that everyone consider joining the Quixel Tools group on Facebook. It oh, is yeah. facebook.com slash groups slash Quixel Tools group, all one word. It is a, uh, I think it's 15,000 members now. Yeah, there's and quite a bit of stuff happening there. Oh yeah, it's just full of people posting artwork all the time and uh -huh. it's just so cool that like it's so hands off for me because I, I look at it every day. It's part of my job and I like that you guys are so chill that all you do is just post work and you barely fight with each other and it's just like here's how I can make this and here's how I can show you how to make this and and oh you don't know how to do that let me show you and it's like it's so nice to see like this community is just tight knit like that even though there's you know people who have never met each other they're just really 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 cool yeah so i mean it's it's quite an honor to to do what i'm doing and, and interact with so many people so i'm sure you feel the same way oh yeah totally Especially since you're going to be getting pulled to do more of these streams, so. I am. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Especially when you're done with this project. Yeah. We have to we have to do the final breakdown of it, right? Yeah. You know what, man? I'm looking at this this bomb that you did, yeah. and I'm just thinking, I wish I had put some particles into my project. I should have made the the engines have like the train engines have smoke coming out of them or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot this, of extra just... depth to the scene. Yeah, I, I don't even know where. Like, I think this is just like default, like particles from Unreal. Like I, I literally just search for like smoke in the example uh, content, and that's what I found. So I didn't even do it myself. So sorry. <laughs> hey, Victor, um, haven't you done an Endu tutorial for sci-fi stuff in the past? Yeah, I have. Do you have the link to that handy so that I can paste it into the chat? Ooh, it might be... It should be on the YouTube channel, but it could be hidden. Um, I'm going to check real quick. Uh, I'm guessing you're talking about the um, the floor tile. 
Um, uh, I'm not entirely sure. The question was, make a an Endu tutorial for sci-fi style trims, please. Like the stuff you did for the Office demo. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think... I mean the yeah there's there's some problems with the um, with the recording it's a very old video but this one goes over um, I'm just checking it through yeah I create a sci-fi floor tile sort of thing uh, but it's in Endu too it's not in the new one but it's uh, it's it's the same principle um, pretty much. Um, I create a whole bunch of tutorials. I'm trying to think which would be the most relevant. Um, but for sci-fi, I think this is the only one I've made. Um, I've made a couple of tutorials where I'm detailing stuff. Um, I think I'm detailing the wipeout ship. But yeah, totally oh, check out yeah. the um, um, Quick Souls YouTube channel because there's a lot of tutorials there. And also the website, of course. Quixel.se. Um, I'm not sure which you are like. I went ahead and uh, I'm pasting a link into chat too as, as well. Uh, it's the Endu tutorial that I wrote up. If mm -hmm. you're a, a fan of doing hard surface stuff and you don't like watching videos, that's probably something you might find interesting. Oh, yeah. Or as a to watching videos. I We had a, a while there where people were complaining that we were making too many videos and not enough text tutorials. So uh, earlier this year, I was just like, you know what? I'll just do it. I'll just write it up. I'll just show you how I do something. It was kind of nice timing, too, because I was in the middle of making a take car. So I was like, well, mm. I guess this ugly mug will have to do. So, <laughs> Yeah, we've, we've been doing some text tutorials. Like, um, as I said, like in periods, like sometimes it's more video, sometimes it's more text. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if more people want text tutorials, I would love to make uh, to make a couple. It's a, lot, it's, it's a lot of fun making them and making those as well. You know, I've got a question for you. Shoot. I want to know what your motivation was for doing this. This? This scene? Yes, this. Oh, um, well, I really just wanted to create as many different sort of environments as possible. And I thought this, like, my first goal was to make it volcanic, as I said before. Um, so... Maybe a lava stream and like some dead trees. Like so, the base you see here would be the the volcanic environment. But then I started playing around with the roughness, uh, and I just saw it looked looked so cool with the um, like when it looked sort of wet and muddy, and like I got these World War One um, vibes. And when I when I sent it over to Linus, um, a colleague at Quixel, he sent back a link with the ink spots i don't want to set the world on fire and i, told, I instantly got what he meant it was like totally post-apocalyptic and he said put a bomb there and i and i did so that's that's my motivation behind it um it took me about i think it was two work days maybe like 12 12 14 hours um to complete it it was uh, very very every simple. time, sorry to cut you off there, but every time I look at your bomb mm -hmm. and I see the writing on the side of it, I think of the two uh, the two black soldiers that were photographed in World War II holding up artillery shells, and they had written on the side of it "Easter eggs for Hitler." <laughs> that's that. This what it, it instantly draws to my mind that that particular image. It's such a cool looking shot that they got back in the day. Oh, I haven't seen that. I'll send you a link to it if you ever want to check it out. Yeah, please do. Just to uh, jump in and answer Peter's question a little while back, he asked, uh, would the import have to be a full material set or can you import a single map to say mix in on a height map? Uh, just expanding the answer Jonathan gave. Um, you can, in fact, I always do this. You can just grab the normal or even just grab the cavity or whatever just to use as a mask in the materials, say a detail normal map. Or in the case of the ice material I did, I didn't actually use albedo or any other maps. I only used cavity to mask out the areas where I wanted ice and water. So it's more than, uh, it's definitely a very valid thing to do, especially when there's extra data that you don't need and you can save obviously in performance. So often I might make three cavity masks and then pack them in Photoshop and bring them out into Unreal. And then you can have three different masks and one texture to play with. So it's definitely really valid, especially when you start getting blending with slopes and, and whatnot. The more masks you can have to break up the slope kind of threshold and, and 
the areas where the slope starts to mask in, it can really start helping. So yeah. mm. um, I d definitely recommend doing that. Now, this is why we have Owen on the stream, because he knows a lot of stuff. And for those of you who are interested, we are going to plan a stream with him as soon as he has an, a project of his own to show. So um, look forward to that. This guy has a ton of knowledge and loves to share it. Yeah, you have quite a few of the awesome scenes co cooking. I know that. <laughs> if there's anything in particular anyone would like to know in the, for that stream, uh, feel free to let us know, and uh, we'll definitely include it just in advance. And if you guys haven't noticed yet, um, the company has been going through a couple changes recently. Uh, we've been focusing more on community outreach. Not that we haven't before, but even more so coming up. Um, as you, many of you are probably here because of the email that was sent out a couple of days ago. We are now moving into you know trying to get out weekly emails, so you guys are in touch with what we're doing more often than you were before. And we're trying to do streams like this so that you can get to know the people behind the company. And you know we we kind of like the the environment of this where we get to see you guys and you get to interact with us and it's not like we're a faceless corporation that doesn't care because we definitely care I mean Quixel is made up by the same artists just like you I mean really the only difference between us and you is that we work for Quixel and you don't that, that's the only difference and anything that we do like any of the stuff that you see here I, I say it all the time and I'm sure people get tired of hearing it by now but anything that you see that Victor has done that I've done that Owen has done that anyone in our company has done is something that you can do and that's the most important thing to take out of all of this, I think, is that every one of you guys is capable of doing all this work. And especially now with Megascans bringing the, what's the best way to describe this? Bringing the artistic focus away from the grunt work and more onto being an artist, making the environments, making the, the composition, making the lighting. I think we really are at this point in a position where we can say we're in like a renaissance of 3D artwork. It's oh, like, yeah. This is unheard of. I mean, I've been doing 3D art since 2000, and I've never seen anything quite like this. I mean, just what he did with Megascan Studio, using any other application would have taken you like a long, long time. And just the quality and the, the, the ability to kick these maps out seamlessly and the stuff that's hidden up there in that corner that I can't talk about, but you'll see really soon, and it's going to blow you away, trust me. Um, there's just so much cool stuff coming and it just keeps getting better yeah. so and yeah uh, the library just keeps keeps growing all the time and as i've just demonstrated like even if what you're looking for is not there you can easily create it from what's already there That's like my favorite part about this too is being able to mix and match scans together to produce something like otherworldly with them you know yeah. It's like what you're making, like it almost looks like a different planet, even though I clearly know that all the scans came from something we've scanned here because yeah. nobody has warp drive yet. So it's uh Yeah, grounded in reality. Exactly. It's yeah. like physically based scanning. Haha. -ha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like as long as, basically the material properties is all that matters. Um you don't need to make anything that really exists. You can you can probably go crazy with alien looking textures and everything, and especially really insane like the acid you had earlier you can just go nuts with it i think mm. uh the worth experimenting there for sure but just using the scan data for what it is just a set of values and a texture and leveraging that to make any kind of thing you can dream up is really the power of, of the studio and the scans well i think if unless i'm wrong here i think this is time to wrap it up and uh maybe we'll see you guys next time yep yeah. sounds good any closing words from you gentlemen no i just want to thank thank everyone for like watching and asking questions it's uh, it's always a lot of fun with these these things and um, yeah thank you for allowing me to to show this well, thank you for being here You're such a you know nice guy taking your time <laughs> to hang out with us you know nice no, it's, it's it's good that you know that we can do this again so yeah no, we're gonna I'd try to love to do it more Definitely going to try to do it more. That's an additional duty I've taken on is finding the time to make these things happen, which, you know, is only a good thing for you guys because it just means that we're going to get more. What's the best way to describe this? Get more involvement with you. Get more, you know, information out there. More learning. Just you know, things are always changing, and if you're not learning with it, you're going to get left behind quickly. Mm -hmm. But that's the nice thing about these streams is that even if you were kind of left behind even a year ago, what you've shown here is enough to get anybody caught up. So. Well, hopefully. 
All right. Well, I think that is going to be it for now. So unless there's any objections, but <laughs> it looks like we're all set. So that was, well, yeah, that was awesome. I'm happy to have been here to, you know, at least do my little part in moderating the chat. So <laughs> despite your cold, that's you're yeah, a trooper. my, my Barry white sickness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Well, good to have you again and look forward to this being on YouTube shortly. I have to log into the Twitch stream and get that all set up, but it'll be up there probably before the end of the day. So um, if, that, again, if that's anything else, I guess that's the end. So, cool. I think yeah, that's it. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot for coming in. See you later.